Hello! First, there was Nintendo. Then, there were 64 of them. Wow, that was amazing. It was like the opening shot to Star Wars, that was. Uh, no, there weren't actually 64 Nintendos. This is the Nintendo 64. And you are probably aware of that, because it's a bloody popular console, and frankly, for pretty good reasons. Whilst it lacks the absolutely ludicrous amount of games released for the PlayStation, there are some absolute corkers for the N64, including several games that went on to change the way games in several genres were designed due to their massive popularity and excellence. But before we get into it, I must tell you that this video is sponsored by SEX! Yeah, CEX, Complete Entertainment Exchange. Look, we did this on the PlayStation video, and it still sounds weird saying SEX. I'm never going to get used to it, am I? But the fact remains that Sex is a chain of retail shops here in the UK, all over Europe, all over the world, in fact. They've got branches in Australia and things, and they buy and sell electronic gubbins and other such entertainment products. Massive thanks to them for sponsoring this video and for lending me loads of bits that I'm going to show you in it. So, the Nintendo 64. So called because it's got a, like, well, it loosely has like a 64-bit processor, but it mostly uses 32-bit instructions. Look, it's one of those things where you had, in the common vernacular, 8-bit consoles, then 16-bit consoles. In the PlayStation, that was 32-bit. So, by putting 64 on it, it sounds super more powerful, even though it wasn't really. And hell, the Atari Jaguar had tried the whole 64-bit thing a couple of years before. I feel it went better for Nintendo, but anyway. The fact remains, the old Project Reality here, or the Ultra 64, both prototype names there, came out about 18 months after the PS1 in the UK, with Nintendo's own spin on the whole 3D gaming thing. Uh, I always, incidentally, really like that logo. Well, they've made the N, 3D. It's good, damn it. Have a close look. Mmm, quality logos. Right, you can go back. And, well, it did pretty bloody well. It wasn't the sort of world-beating thing the PlayStation was, and it lacked third-party game support as compared to the PlayStation. But then again, the PlayStation had such a crazy amount of third-party games that maybe directly comparing is daft. No, we just did it anyway. And it did a lot better than the Sega Saturn, and let's face it, that's the important thing. So it's interesting to see this coming out considerably after the PlayStation. It was one of those things where I think we all assumed the games would look, like, massively superior. And they kind of don't, because, well, the problem with the N64 is it does have its uh, slightly odd low-resolution texture things, which are kind of a bit blurred and, well, filtered, I suppose is the correct term, but... Uh, Put it this way, Nintendo 64 games have a very distinct look, or the 3D ones at the very least, due to the way the textures work. Um, they've not aged particularly well, which is why Nintendo, when re-releasing these things, do have a tendency to uh, sort of upscale and redo textures and things like that. But hey, that's what companies should be doing anyway, so if you're going to re-release a game, do it bloody properly. Also, frame rates tended to be a bit low on some of the N64 games, although you will notice that was pretty much the third-party games. I think Nintendo themselves and the uh, sort of second-party releases tended to be a little bit more on the speedy side. So let's have a look at the mighty device. The first thing you will notice is four controller ports. None of this multi-tap nonsense, straight in for four people. And that is why the N64 was a big-time multiplayer system of choice. Makes perfect sense. Reset button, power on and off, and of course, cartridge slot. Because it still used cartridges. Yeah, in the age of CD, Nintendo went with the cartridge, which was very good from the speed point of view, because of course you can just keep transferring data from the cartridge straight into the machine pretty much instantaneously. Amazing. Whereas a CD is slow. On the downside, uh, cartridges very expensive to produce as compared to a CD. Um, in fact, that's an understatement, the likes of which you will very rarely hear, because you can just knock CDs out very, very quickly and cheaply. Cartridges, oh, yeah, not so much. So the games are more expensive for the N64, like about £10 each more, I want to say, um, as a sort of general rule. And the other big problem was, if games were ported to the N64, they tend to have a lot of stuff missing. Um, sort of, well, music and FMV sequences mostly, because the N64 cartridge can hold a maximum of 64 megabytes. 
CD's got about 650, hasn't it? So all a bit different. However, of course, there is the nice thing, and you can save games to cartridges. So you don't need memory cards. You still totally needed memory packs. We'll get onto them in a minute. <laughs> but you didn't need them for all games. What is this on the front? Memory expansion? What is this madness? Oh, there's an expansion in it. I don't know why I sound surprised. This is my N64. Um, so basically, you could upgrade the RAM, and it had about four megabytes, I believe. In fact, I think it was exactly four megabytes. And you could add another four with this, and it's enabled games basically to run at higher resolutions and have more gubbins in and that. Uh, quite a few games had like expanded modes, and a few of them required the expansion to work. On the sides, you got pretty much nothing. On the back, ooh, what's this big slot? That is the AC adapter in. Yep, the AC adapter came in its own sealed unit, which you connect in the back, clunk click, like that. Marvellous. That's quite a good idea, that, isn't it? Because um, if you've got, I don't know, different systems like in Europe and that, where they've got lower voltages and different plugs on the end, you can just uh, give an entirely different uh, slot in and out piece. Fine. And there you will notice the AV out, or multi-out, as they call it. The actual same connections they used on the Super Nintendo and the GameCube, I believe. And yeah, you plug your cable in and then you plug that cable into your television. That's nice and easy, isn't it? Uh, the reason there's a big recess thing here, incidentally, is if you've got the RF adapter for super old TVs now, you just plug it in there and it sticks out as a square. I don't even have one knocking around anymore now, because who's using RF in this day and age? Very few people, because it's the lowest quality output and most modern televisions won't take it. Uh, so, this is where we do have to mention a big problem with the N64. S-Video is the best quality you can get out of this. And that ain't great. You really want RGB SCART, but sadly, not a thing. This will only give you composite or S-Video, which is not great. There are N64s in existence which have RGB SCART out, and they are French. For in France at the time, it was a legal requirement that your games consoles and things had RGB SCART output, which is why French N64s tend to go for a lot more than other ones. But uh, yeah, for us here in the UK and in America and everywhere like that, you have S-Video the best, so yeah, your output isn't great. And to make things worse, it's incredibly difficult to mod one of these for high quality output to the extent that you actually have to like carve bits off the motherboard and replace them. To say it's an easy process would be a big fat lie, so I'm going to say this instead. Celery's all right, but I wouldn't want to eat a lot of it. And on the bottom of the machine, another expansion port hidden away under whatever label was on that at some point. Ooh, what does that connect to? I believe there was only ever one thing made that that actually connects to, and that was the 64DD, which sounds like a bra size, but was actually a floppy disk add-on that only came out in Japan. It only had like nine games or something. It didn't do very well. <laughs> it was like Nintendo's, this is going to be our big thing, it's going to help development, so we're going to have all games out, it's going to be cheaper because they're on floppy disks. It did not catch on. But this incredibly dark grey Nintendo 64 may have been the standard, but they produced loads of different colours in these. A lot of sort of semi-translucent ones in pink and orange and green and all sorts of colours. But they also produced what I think must be my favourite, <laughs> possibly, possibly my absolute favourite design of any home console, because it's so weird. Look at this Pokemon Edition one. Oh, that's the stuff. Got old Pikachu on it. Look, listen to his special catchphrase. Jigglypuff, you got it wrong. You keep quiet for the rest of this video. You've embarrassed us all, Pikachu. Right, yeah, um, obviously in the colours of Pokemon to, uh, yeah, keep the kids who are into Pokemon interested. And it's all the little details I enjoy in this. I mean, just the thing, there's Pokemon, Pikachu, Nintendo 64. Uh, power button is a Pokeball. That's the stuff, but really, it's just this massive moulded Pikachu on it, screaming in agony, I presume. I, I don't really know what he's doing there, but it's a very odd choice. But not as odd as old Ash Ketchum here telling us, press here to reset. Yes, the reset button on this is his foot. I, I, that's such an odd design. This has got to be the only console ever created where you reset it by tickling a character's foot. Very odd indeed. And I can actually show you in here this is what one looks like without the memory expansion in. It says, do not remove this label. 
I mean, you can remove the label, it won't really matter, but it's to make sure that you leave this in there because the um, N64 will not power on if it doesn't have this... Uh, I think they're just like jumpers. I think it just connects basically part of the console to another part and you can remove that and put the expansion pack in. But if that's empty, it ain't turning on. And there's another difference. Notice the lack of the 64DD connector thingy. Hmm. And interestingly, this was released about six months after the 64DD. So was it a case of they thought, ah, oh, this one's just going out for the kids. Uh, they're probably not going to buy a 64DD. Let's not bother putting the connector on it and save a bit of money. Or had it got to the stage already a few months in where they were like, right, that's completely bombed. We're not even going to bother putting the connector on it. The answer, my friends, I don't know. I hope that helps. Now, we did mention briefly memory cards. Look, here's one. They are called Controller Packs, P-A-K. Because that spelling annoys me. I presume these were made purely to annoy me. I can't think of another reason they would have done. Anyway, as I said, a lot of games, especially the first party Nintendo ones, would save onto the cartridge. Some wouldn't, or needed more uh, space for the data. And that's where these came in. Where do you put them? Not here. As the name hints, they go into the controller, as I'll show you in a minute. And this was a system where you really did want, at least in my experience, the official controller packs, because, I mean, look, here's the third party one here. Ultra 64, memory card 256 from Blaze. Oh, it's got to save loads more data onto it. In my experience, uh, at least these days, maybe they've um, degenerated over time or something, but about 50% of these uh, third-party memory cards just don't work anymore. This one is completely dead. You can't save or load anything to it. And even this amazing memory card plus, where you can actually select between four different memory cards internally, effectively, is half dead. Uh, I believe that three and four work and one and two don't, if I remember. Old Interact memory card plus there. Yeah, they're very hit and miss these. If you are buying yourself a Nintendo 64, do try and go for the official ones. Because if not, you may be in no savey town, and that is a bad town to live in. Jump cut to N64 controllers. Hmm. So, yeah, people have strong opinions on this M-shaped thingamajig. Uh, it's, it's an oddity. It takes a sort of different approach to the uh, things like the Dual Shock and uh, other such controllers, as you can tell by the central analog stick. So, you can basically hold it like this if you're playing a game that uses the D-pad and you've got access to your L and R buttons, your four C buttons there, the directional things, and your A and B. And to be perfectly honest, not many games really are played like that. A couple of fighting games and some others, but mostly you're going to be wanting access to the analog stick, which means you're probably going to hold it like this. Um, that's the classic golden eye grip <laughs> where you can control like that. And then you've got strafing and all that kind of stuff and selecting weapons. And if you need to, you can quickly knock your hand over here onto the D-pad and use that for something. And this is mostly enabled by whoop, the Z button, which is on the back there as a trigger. So bang, 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 bang. Or potentially you could go like that, bang, 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 bang. But this tends to be less of a method because you've got obviously access to only the D-pad and not six buttons like you would there. Um, it also means you'd end up not using the L button, but you can use the right. So it's interesting in that you can change up your grip depending on the game, but it's not a design that caught on, I think is the politest way to put it. It's not terrible or anything. I actually don't mind this controller particularly, but uh, a lot of people to this day hate it with the passion of a thousand burning suns. And if you haven't guessed, that's where your controller pack goes in. Click. There we go. And often you'd have a much bigger controller pack, especially third party ones like those giant ones we had earlier. But uh, let's not worry about that. There is one thing I never liked about this. The analog stick you'll notice is in this sort of um, weird recess to give you quick access or well, easy access to all eight cardinal directions there. But mm, I mean, you can't, I don't know if you can hear this at home, probably not. It's very crunchy. These things tend to wear against themselves and then fill up, I presume, in little bits of plastic. I basically need to open all these and clean them out. And it feels very crunchy, as if somebody's been eating cornflakes and dropped a load down there. And that happens relatively quickly after buying one of these. And if you're buying one secondhand these days, that is going to be a thing. But at least you can get them in many colours. Look, here's a green one. Spoilers. Um, yeah. You could have a green N64 with a green controller. But if you went to buy your second controllers, yeah, there were an awful lot of colours on offer. Green being one of them. Here's another important one. The one that came with the Pokemon one. It's just blue and it says Pokemon on it. 
thanks for that. And of course, the infamous Golden Archers, the Golden Controller, which was definitely a thing. I don't know why. Um, I, I never liked the look of this because I was always convinced it has that look of something where the gold paint is going to wear off. I was completely wrong. I mean, this is years old and like it, it's just as durable as any other colour. <laughs> it's a perfectly good paint job. I don't know. Perhaps I've been horribly bitten by um, metallic painted things in the past. But there we are, the nifty controller and goes nicely with golden eyes. So you can pretend it's a golden gun that for some reason is in the shape of a weird tiara from a 1970s Italian sci-fi film. Now, you saw something fall down earlier. Here's a rare boy. The little Hori controller for the N64. You do not see many of these because they were only released in Japan. And as you can see, it swapped the analog stick. It's also got a much nicer one, frankly. Um, ooh, clean that one up a bit. But uh, yeah, it's got a sort of nicer feel to it and doesn't have the crunchiness at the bottom. The D-pad's weirdly in the centre, but then again, as you tend to only use that for selecting things, that's not bad. And you've got your C buttons on that here. And this is interesting, L and R, but your Z trigger is both of those. Ah, and obviously it has the connector for all your controller packs and stuff. It is an interesting little thing, this. And I always thought, oh, I really want one of those. I'm sure it will be amazing. Well, people with smaller hands than me say it's amazing. Unfortunately, it's smaller than I thought it was. And I can't really, um, you can see I can only sort of push the buttons with that part of my finger. I can, you really need to be able to hold it more like this. So if you have little, little hands of an elf, this is probably the greatest controller Unfortunately, I don't, so I find it bloody difficult, which is a shame. So I've wanted one of these for years, finally got one, and... Uh. But don't worry, why would I play games with that like an idiot when I could be playing games with... Oh, God, hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah. This big thing. <laughs> it doesn't even fit in the frame. Right. So, welcome to the Vortex, gamers. Um, I take that off, actually. So... Look, you've got your thing in the back, you've got some uh, buttons here, you've got a really uncomfortable thing with a bad D-pad and no analogue stick. And as we previously said on more than one occasion, you really need that analogue stick. Uh, it also has built-in rumble. You had to put in a rumble pack for the other controllers, but that's actually built into this, which is interesting. Um, but you do have to switch between rumble and save. We'll get onto that in a minute when we see some other stuff. So why would you have something as awful as this with crap auto fire and slow down options? Yeah, we know what they do. Nothing. Well, the secret lies in this switch, and obviously this massive thing here. So, you put this on there. I think we may have to actually move the camera up a bit. There we are. And, oh my god, you can move it! Left, right, up, down. Really, that would be flight mode. For all your flight sim games on the N64, which really there aren't any. I mean, you've got Pilot Wing 64, but that hardly needs its own sort of controller like this. Although, having said that, Mad Cats, back in the day, did release a flight stick for the N64. I just <laughs> don't really know what that was used for, but there we are, it did exist. So, yeah, I mean, have a go at Star Fox with it. It's not going to control well, because that's not what it's designed for. And frankly, this sort of whole moving backwards and forwards thing does not work very well. However, switch that to that, take that off, swap this round, and wait for it. <gasps> doom, 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 doom. Look! Still got your up and down movement. Still got a little bit of left and right. But look at that for steering wheels. See, isn't that actually a good idea? Because surely that's going to be good for steering stuff, isn't it? So I had a go on several of the speedy racy games for the N64, and this is absolute crap. Um, it's completely useless. It just doesn't work properly. I honestly thought there was something wrong with it, but apparently uh, it is kind of a thing. So you go like that, and the car moves around perfectly, as you would expect. Ooh. But then the next time it doesn't. It sort of has a massive delay of like a second. And sometimes it just doesn't move at all. Like literally you'll go, oh, like that and nothing happens. I don't know what it is, but for some reason, the little controller thing on the back here, which you think, you know, spinning left and right would be a very simple thing, just doesn't seem to work correctly. And that is why when I bought this, I was told it was a pile of crap. And I was like, don't worry, I'm only going to do a video on it. But they were right. I mean, it just doesn't work. <laughs> it really is as simple as that. Such a shame. So all you can do with it is play fighting games on an incredibly bad D-pad and on a comfortable controller. Brilliant. Well done. 
Well done. Right, let's maneuver this back down. Whoop. Because there's always one of these, isn't there? There is always one of these bloody things where you try and control things in midair and it doesn't quite work properly. Oh god, so I already knew that this existed for the PlayStation, but was amazed to discover there was an N64 version! Yeah! Yay! And you, you can use it in either hand, that's good, isn't it? Your toy spaceship and your fishing rod controller. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's look at this part first. This is the tilting part. Can I draw your attention to this important sticker for the reset button? It's never a good sign if one of the most important things it tells you is how to calibrate it, because it means you've got to do it every five bloody minutes. Um, you've got some... Uh, oh no, those aren't sensitivity controls, they are down here. Yeah, your reset button, that one doesn't do anything. And basically, uh, let's put it on. Oh, good. Right, strap that on there, put that around there, and uh, there we are. Now you've got that. And if you want to go left and right, you can go... Rah, 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 rah. I don't think there's any forwards and backwards on this one. I can't, I can't, you know, I can't remember. I never used it this week. That's how bad it was. <laughs> but yeah, you go like that and it moves left and right. The one thing I liked about this is this setting, if you notice, actually flicks around the tilt switch inside. So if you do that, you can then hold your hand like that and move left and right there, like the PlayStation Glove one. But it's still awful. Um, yeah, it's not good at all. It basically barely works. Um, you can get a bit of left and right movement. There's no finesse. It doesn't really work when you need it to. Blah, blah, rubbish. You've got an LCD screen on it, which doesn't tell you a whole lot, to be honest. D-pad here and a million buttons that you can't quite reach. And incredibly, a trigger here and then like two triggers. I'm not even sure how you're supposed to hold this. I mean, surely you can't hold it with um, all three buttons depressed. You'd have to go like that for the trigger. Then you've got an extra trigger there and then you can just move your finger up for that one, I suppose. Oh, Gamester, what were you thinking? You were thinking this was going to be some amazing gimmick for the kids, but you didn't care about small things like whether it actually works properly or not. Ah, uh, dearie me. Boo! While we're looking at all these cool Nintendo things, allow me to remind you that many of them are available to purchase from Sex. As in the shops. You know what I mean. For they sell many retro gaming related items. Your consoles and your games and your controllers and all that kind of jazz. They also sell an awful lot of other electronic items. Your tablets and your phones and stuff. And also media and all your entertainment gubbins. But most importantly, they will also allow you to trade in items towards them. Which is very useful if you've got old phones sitting around in drawers that you haven't got any use for. And leading on directly from that, I decided to clear out my drawer with the phones in. Dun dun dun! Basically, got a couple of old phones in a drawer, been there a few years, and I keep them in there just in case I need them in an emergency. It's never going to happen, is it? They're just sitting in there, going down in value, and will eventually end up in a landfill if I don't do something about it. So, I empty them out, the old phones were, wait for it, an old Google Pixel 3 from about five years ago and an old Samsung from about five or six years ago. And I also found, get this, this really old Asus tablet, um, a Nexus 7. This is about 11 years old or something. I honestly thought I got rid of it about six years ago, but no, it's been sitting in a drawer. So not any longer, because if I was to take these to sex today, for the benefits of this video, now is early June 2023, in case you're watching this in the future, I could swap these three devices directly for a Nintendo 64 with all your cables and bits and bobs, a controller, a memory pack, Super Mario 64, GoldenEye 007, Wave Race 64, and Lilac Wars. All four of those things I've literally got sitting in a drawer I'm not doing anything with. So why not go and have a look in your local sex and see what they've got available? And I tell you what, if you want stuff that's on the website that isn't available, you can trade stuff in there and then use the voucher online and get them ordered like that. Because they have all sorts of interesting bits and bobs. You never really know what you're going to find in there, which is the joy of a second-hand shop. So hey folks, why not go and investigate sex? Oh god, that came out wrong. Quickly, cut to the next bit! Now, as was mentioned earlier, there is also the Rumble Pack. Mmm. You put two batteries in it, and it makes your controller vibrate. It is just the Rumble function for games. Simple as. And you slot it into the top, and it takes up more room than the moon. <laughs> it's quite a big thing. It doesn't matter. There's not that much weight to it, and it doesn't really get in the way. But there we are. Uh, the problem is, 
you can, as you can tell, only have a controller pack if you're saving games, or <sighs> bloody pain in the bum. Oh, sorry, sorry, I get that way. Ah. A rumble pack. So if the games keep asking you, basically, once you've saved game, are you using a rumble pack? If so, remove the controller pack and put the rumble pack in now. It is a real pain in the bum hole. But fortunately, third party companies came and saved us with combined technology. Look at that. The N64 Jolt Pack 1 megabyte. So you've basically got <laughs> four different memory cards on here from this slightly opaque um, selector system. Put your double A's in it and also you've got a rumble pack. So you have it in there, switch to memory card, and then when it says switch to rumble pack now you can go click and then it will act as a rumble pack. Unfortunately, this one, uh, the entire memory in it's dead, as we mentioned earlier. Third party memory cards, the N64, always seem to be bad. Is it just me? Have I just been unlucky with these? I don't think so. That is my guess. But the most important thing is, Joytech made a pure rumble pack that looks like this. A bumble pack. Hoo-hoo! So you can make it look like a massive wasp is making love to your controller. Also, it doesn't fit properly. Look, there's a big gap. That is really not a good rumble pack. It does work. So there we are. Another thing you could plug in here is this. The uh, transfer pack. Now, this is a bit interesting, right? You plug Game Boy games into it. Much like that. You know, so I've picked Wave Race because there's a really good version of Wave Race for the N64. But also, um, I should point out that this doesn't actually work with a transfer pack. Frankly, very few games did. But the idea was you put your Game Boy in it and you can get data from the Game Boy whoop, onto your N64. Yeah. The weakness was only like six games outside Japan actually used it. And the only one I can think of that was any actual proper use was, of course, Pokemon Stadium. As any of you who will have played Pokemon Stadium will know, it actually came with one of these, if I recall correctly. And uh, yeah, you could transfer Pokemon from, uh, if you had like Pokemon, what was it Pokemon Red, Pokemon Blue, Pokemon Yellow, you could plug them in here and transfer your little Pikachus and all those blighters through your cable into N64 and fight with them, or at the very least, fight with the statistics they had in Pokemon Stadium on your N64. And more excitingly, you could actually play the Pokemon games through the N64 due to some sort of internal emulation thing. So that's pretty cool. But frankly, that's about it. The only other one I can think of was, I think, Perfect Dark. If you plugged in the Game Boy Color version of Perfect Dark, it unlocked some cheats that you could just unlock in the game anyway. It was all kind of pointless, sadly, and only really Pokemon Stadium and I think the sequel, which I believe was called Pokemon Stadium 2, uh, actually had any real use for it. But Stuart, you yell at me from your secret underground lair, how would we play import games on our Nintendo 64s? And well, friends, I'm glad you asked, because you would need something like this the ultra 64 v ultra 64 sfx 64 v3 from blaze universal game adapter <sighs> and look here's another one that does exactly the same thing called the n64 passport plus so let us imagine for a minute that two of these games are japanese in fact these are all uk games but for the purposes of this we should pretend this is a japanese game plug it in here you ain't gonna have any joy you can't play the fantastic Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue. Um, so what you do is you pop it in here and then get a UK game, the uh, fantastic show of the Empire, and plug that in the back. Ooh. And what it does is it reads the first bit of the cartridge off the UK one there and then launches the rest of the cartridge, so to speak, from the Japanese one at the top. It's quite clever, little internal switcheroo. And the N64 Passport Plus works in exactly the same way. See, if you want to play the classic Daikatana, pretty sure there wasn't a Japanese version of that, and you can plug the classic Carmageddon 64 into the back, and it'll do the same job. And now, the stupid bit. If you were wondering if you can use two of these devices and convert from uh, UK to Japanese and then Japanese back to UK and plug it in and see if it works or not. Well, you can do that. And you know what? It does bloody work. <laughs> it genuinely does. This completely pointless looping system when you could have just gone. 
But where's the fun in that, eh? Oh, and uh, if you're wondering if they were Game Genie type devices, oh yeah, Explorer 64, the ultimate cheat cartridge from Blaze. Stick your cartridge on the top, and uh, that's it really, putting codes and stuff like that, and cheat and have infinite lives and all that gubbins. And there's a little serial port at the back if you want to connect it to your PC, good luck trying that these days. But uh, yeah, it does the job. And more importantly, if you put this in, <laughs> and then you put all this gubbins on top, does that still boot? Incredibly, the answer is yes. So, time to look at the most important thing, the games. And this is what one looks like boxed, specifically GoldenEye 007, which is excellent. Only for Nintendo 64. No longer true. It finally got a modern updated re-releasey thing recently, didn't it? My god, that took a while, the joys of licensing. But anyway, soft cardboard box. Not entirely dissimilar to the ones the Super Nintendo games came in. And I'll tell you what, as you probably guessed, they just didn't survive. They got damaged. They got lost, they got thrown away. And this one's not in bad nick, actually, but the corner's a bit off. But um, overall, well, let's put it this way. I own about 20 Nintendo 64 games, and not a single one of them is boxed. For these boxes were just too gentle for this world. And yeah, um, good luck finding one in mint condition these days. It's probably going to have to be uh, old stock or something. Inside the box, you've got a cartridge, strangely enough. Here it is. And... Oop, skipped into the packaging there. There we are. They all look like that. Ex except they had, you know, different labels on to tell you what game was on them. You probably worked that bit out yourself. And cardboard retainer to stop it flapping about in the large box. And an instruction booklet. Ooh, this one's seen better days, but it does exist. And tells you how to play the game and all that kind of stuff. That was easy, wasn't it? So, getting into the nitty gritty of Nintendo 64 games. As I said earlier, for the N64, it was all about the... F well, really, it was all about the first party, Nintendo themselves, and Rare, frankly. Old Rare, who made GoldenEye 007 and completely revolutionised the FPS genre while it bloody did it. In fact, as I think I hinted at earlier, there are three games for the Nintendo 64 which had a massive impact on other games of the genre. They were massively influential, and they were, of course, Carmageddon 64, Dai Katana, and Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue. No, wait, that's not right. GoldenEye 007, Super Mario 64, and Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. That's more like it. Yes, GoldenEye 007, with its FPS sniper rifle shenanigans, was massively influential, and frankly, I think, bettered in Perfect Dark, the sort of uh, spiritual successor to it, which is a fantastic game, and available on uh, various formats these days, I believe. Zelda Ocarina of Time, an action adventure -y game with RPG elements, again, massively influential, big old open world and stuff, and of course Super Mario 64, which basically showed that you could do a platform game in 3D without it being less fun than attending the funeral of everyone you've ever met. Also, what's that? Super 64 Mario, it looks like they've written there. Oh, please, guys, get your numbers in order. Yeah, and there are many other fantastic games for the system. You've got things like F-Zero X, really like F-Zero X, bit of uh, futuristic racing. Wave Race 64 is fun. Uh, you've got Star Fox 64, which is amazing, but inexplicably called Lilat Wars here in the UK. I'm presuming some sort of uh, name copyright shenanigans or something going on, but Star Fox 64 is a great name. Lilat Wars. Less so, I think, frankly. And oh, look. Here's my copy of Wave Race 64 that I mentioned earlier, and I should have got out. Jewel. Um, Blast Core. If you've never played Blast Core, you should probably bloody play Blast Core. I got this cheap, not knowing what to expect back in the day. Absolutely blew me away. And also, blowing things away is kind of the point of the game as well. It is excellent. Now, I am going to show you 10 Nintendo 64 games, all captured from original hardware. Now, please. Do not expect to see all your favourite games or anything like that. In fact, don't expect to see any of your favourite games. <laughs> because I'm purely picking ones that to this day you can only play on the Nintendo 64. And this is difficult because, as I think I said earlier, pretty much every actual first-party Nintendo game has been released on other systems. Multiple times in some cases. I mean, Super Mario 64 had a DS version. I think you can get it on Switch. It's, you know, it's all over the place. Zelda Ocarina of Time had like a 3D version on the 3DS. Um, yeah, pretty much all of these are available on one thing or another. And the Rare games also are right out, mostly due to Rare Replay for the Xbox One, which 30 games you got, right? 
and all of them playing on your Xbox One, upgraded and looking great. I mean, frankly, on here you've got Conker's Bad Fur Day, which is pretty amazing, uh, Banjo Tooie, Blast Core that we mentioned earlier, and Jet Force Gemini is amazing. Oh, and Perfect Dark's on it as well. I mean, what more do you bloody want? And you know what? You can currently buy this in sex. The, the shop sex, you know what I mean, for £3 as of the time I'm saying this, which is early June 2023. Um, three quid. Three quid for all that. Yeah. So, 10 Nintendo 64 games you can't play on anything else that I think are quite interesting for one reason or another. And the first is the one we mentioned recently, Hybrid Heaven! Which is weird. <laughs> this is a game um, that I had never played despite owning a cartridge, because the cartridge has never worked. I've still got it in case I can magically fix it one day. It's not going to happen. Um, and I sort of never heard anybody mention it. And then suddenly streamers seemed to pick up on it a few years ago. And now you sort of see people playing it quite often. And i got to say, it's really bloody interesting. An RPG full of mutants and hybrids and weird alien blighters. And you run around in a big underground facility, which is a shame, because uh, as far as I can see, you never seem to get out of that facility. So the backgrounds are a bit dull, but uh, hey, I haven't played the game enough to see right at the end. Maybe the end of it's in a beautiful orchard. It's not going to be, is it? Um, but what is interesting is it has this turn-based um, battle mechanics, which are really good fun. And you target different body parts and learn different moves and stuff. And you end up learning, like, wrestling moves. And you end up, like, pile-driving um, weird mutant insect people and stuff like that. It is genuinely very interesting game. I do know this is one of the games that I've sort of now appeared on my radar, I'm going to have to play through this at some point, because it's just got that kind of weird vibe to it that I enjoy, and I do like a bit of turn-based combat as well. Next up, Body Harvest. Now this is interesting, it's kind of a bit Grand Theft Auto before Grand Theft Auto. So uh, not in sense of plot or anything like that, basically you play like a guy in Space Marine armour who goes around blowing up giant insects that are invading the Earth. However, you have big old weapons and go boom 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 and that, but you can also jump into vehicles that you find along the way. And this game's pretty bloody good fun! Um, yeah, a lot of fun explosion stuff, a lot of fun vehicle stuff, and annoyingly you also get stuck behind fences and vehicles, which really, really bugs me. But, other than that, Body Harvest is a lot of fun. And again, one of these games, don't hear many people talking about these days. You also don't hear people talking about Dual Heroes, and for good reason. So, <laughs> this thing always sticks in my mind, because in the early days of the Nintendo 64, before it was released and all that, we were all looking at the hype and getting hyped up and, ooh, M64 and all that sort of stuff, although I think they were referring to it as Ultra 64 at that stage. Well, this was the game they always showed you a screenshot of, and it always showed just one character on a black background, and it was like incredibly high res and amazing looking. It looked like a sort of photograph of a Power Ranger almost. And you're like, oh my god, this is gonna be absolutely a Oh, yeah, that came out, and it was this. So, yeah, basically, one on one fighting game. Characters all look like they've escaped from the Power Rangers, as I say, and it's bad. It's, I mean, I've played a lot worse, um, but. I've played an awful lot better as well, do you know what I mean? The big problem with it is, from my point of view, controls aren't responsive enough. You need responsive controls in a fighting game, that is very bloody important. And as a result it's just sort of weird and sluggish and not much fun to play, and it is a real bloody shame. But if you want an actually decent fighting game on the N64, you want Fighter's Destiny. Well, really, you want Fighter's Destiny 2, which is better all round, and probably one of the best fighting games on the N64, but sadly not released in the UK, so no good for the purpose of this video. <sighs> anyway, Fighter's Destiny is super entertaining, basically. It's a really well put together fighting game, responsive controls, everything flows well, it's got a nice feel of chunky smacks and hits when you knock your opponent about, and there's a really fun mechanic where you can shimmy around ledges to avoid ringouts. And you can pick up a copy for a few pounds, which is nice. So, next is a game that I don't like, but your mileage may vary. <laughs> it's Mischief Makers from the excellent game makers at Treasure. I could never get on with this game. So, as you can see, 2D platformer. Um, there's a lot of odd mechanics about gripping onto things and throwing yourself about and throwing things at other things and this kind of stuff. And as I say, I could never get on with it. The controls for me felt so weird. They made me feel like my arms were going odd, is the only way I can describe it. I could never get on with this game at all. And uh, my friend John, who is playing the footage you are seeing here at the moment, couldn't get on with it either. 
Um, it was just didn't work for both of us, though, but it is generally a very well thought of game. If you can get over the weird controls, as I couldn't, you'll probably have a lot of fun with Mischief Makers. It's all about some space cyborg woman and all these weird, annoying monsters that you completely hassle and torture by picking up and shaking them and chucking bombs at them and stuff. I mean, what's not to like? Well, for me, the controls, but hey. Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue! Yeah, I keep joking about that in this video, and I'll tell you what, it's an absolute pile of horses done. Games with this name were also released for the PlayStation, the Game Boy Color, and the Macintosh, but they are all completely different games. Thank God. This would be, I think, the worst game on the system if it were not for Superman 64, but yeah, we'll get onto that. <clears throat> so, Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue. You know how the Power Rangers are all about Kung Fu and stuff? Well, there's none of that in this game. You run around in incredibly dull, huge, empty levels, firing weird sparks out of your hands and feet for some reason, and you get very bored. And then you get onto the other parts of the game where you can, like, fly this weird spaceship around, and it's so sluggish and slow to manoeuvre. To turn it around, it's like turning some sort of, I don't know, massive warship or something. Absolutely terrible. Uh, then you've got the Megazord fighting sequences, which are abysmal, and then you've got the very worst bit of all, the driving sections, which are slow and stupid. And uh, the only good thing about these is if you do hit an innocent car, it basically flies into orbit for no reason, so bonus points for that. But yeah, it's an absolutely abysmal game. It's stupidly easy. Well, it's probably made for kids, so we would maybe let them off that bit, but we won't let them off the fact that it's cripplingly boring rubbish, and frankly, kids deserve a lot better. It even sounds sarcastic when you complete a level. Yay! Quite rightly, this game was completely panned. 64 magazine here in the UK gave it minus 25%. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how negative percentages work, but they gave it minus 25%. Reviewed by friend of the channel Paul Gannon, of all people, and I've got to say, after playing it, can't see where he's coming from. Ah, Robotron 64. So this is technically a port of Robotron X for the PlayStation, but I'm counting it separately because it's massively upgraded. It's got upgraded graphics. Most importantly, they fixed the camera, which was too tight and awful on Robotron X and totally ruined the game. And interestingly, you can play it one player with two N64 controllers with an analog stick in each hand. So a uh, twin stick joy in the early days, which is pretty bloody clever. Yeah, it's, as you can tell, an update of Robotron. Nice and simple. Shooty, shooty, blasty, blasty. It's really good fun. Get through the level, get through another level. High scores, you know how Robotron works. However, I will say, it's probably still not as good as Llamatron on the Atari ST and Amiga. <laughs> Jeff Minter's absolute classic. But it is still a nice, super fun game. And now a game I didn't even know existed until recently, Beetle Adventure Racing! As in the Volkswagen Beetle, not the insect. This is just really good fun. Super fun game. Blom around tracks in your Volkswagen Beetles, having races and finding weird shortcuts through barns and goodness knows what else. Really nice tight controls, nice feeling of speed, nice and smooth. Just a really good fun arcadey racing game from start to finish. Back when the WWE was WWF, there was no mercy. Yes, this game is called WWF No Mercy. And I'll tell you what, friends, it's a bloody good one. The graphics, not good for the time, frankly, but the gameplay, oh yeah, this is kind of the parent of modern wrestling games, maybe? Is that overselling it a bit? I don't know, but it's got everything in it. It's the first proper 3D wrestling game, as far as I'm concerned. And my god, everybody was playing it who was into wrestling back in the day. I'm not a huge wrestling man myself, but I remember playing this round of friends and being incredibly impressed just with the sort of fluidity and the fun of it. And you know, the more I think about it, the more I wonder if I should have put No Mercy in with Super Mario 64, GoldenEye 007 and Zelda Ocarina of Time earlier as those kind of massively influential games. Because I feel like nearly every modern wrestling game can sort of trace a line very directly back to this. So if you are interested in wrestling games in general, and you haven't played this one, you really do need to go back and look at it. It was a massive win for Nintendo fans at the time, because PS1 wrestling games, yeah, generally not that good. But this one, it may look like all the characters have been smashed together out of cereal boxes, but yeah, it's got the gameplay where it counts. 
And finally, yeah, we had to cover it because it's only out for the Nintendo 64. There was a PlayStation version being made, but it was never released. It's Superman 64, an infamously awful game. And I'll tell you what, the people aren't joking, is absolutely unbelievable. So you know how Superman is like super strong and he's invulnerable and he can fly and shoot laser beams out of his eyes? Well, can you think of cool things you could do with him? If your answer to that is yes and it's fly through hoops, perhaps you designed this game. So yeah, Lex Luthor in this game literally has Superman flying through hoops for him. <laughs> Like, I don't mean he's getting him to do lots of little missions, as in going through hoops. I mean, literally, you fly through hoops. And the controls are awful, so the whole thing is a massive, irritating, frustrating chore. And you get little extra bits in between, like here's something where you've got to save two people from getting run over by cars. Just look at it! Look how flat the floor is! And then you've got the kryptonite fog, which uh, seriously restricts your view. Basically, the whole game's massively foggy. I'm not going to complain about that too much, because that was a feature of several uh, N64 games. Didn't have much of a draw distance and used fog as sort of an excuse for that. But yeah, this is absolutely no fun at all. In fact, I would go as far to say it's the opposite of fun. It also has weird multiplayer modes, which are so badly put together is it, this bloody game man i know the story of it goes that the developers wanted to make a certain type of superman game and dc comics right now superman's got to do this that and the other and totally ruin things but still this is technically so awful i can't imagine that even a better concept would have come out much better to play i mean look at it and you know what the cartridge goes for a relatively high price these days I know people go on and on about how bad this game is, but they are absolutely right. It really does live up to the anti-hype. This game is a complete pile of fetid dingo's kidneys, and all copies of it should be destroyed by orbital lasers immediately. So that was the Nintendo 64. At the very least, a tiny little part of the accessories and games and its legacy and all that kind of stuff. And you know what? We didn't even mention bizarre Star Wars multimedia crossover event, Shadows of the Empire, where there was a game, obviously for N64 and the PC, I believe. And if I recall correctly, the first level on the Battle of Hoth was all right. And the rest of the game was pretty stinky, so uh, let's skip over that. So if you are UK-based like me, you may not realise how big of a deal the N64 was in America. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was popular over here, but it was crazy popular in America at a certain point. Like, it was absolutely the thing that kids of a certain age wanted. I mean, hell, do you remember that um, viral video, the N64 kid who's opening up his N64 on Christmas and going absolutely ballistic? I think that is quite a good time capsule of what was going on there at the time. It never reached uh, quite that that sort of status over here. But as I say, it was certainly not unpopular by any means. I can remember going and buying my 007 Golden Eye pack and buying uh, Super Mario 64 as well. Tell you what I should have got at the time as well, actually. Bloody Mario Kart 64 is astonishing. Clear all that away, because it's that time in the video where we say, what's an easy way to play your Nintendo 64 on a modern television? And unfortunately, the answer is pretty much you're going to have to use S-Video or even composite through some sort of adapter. Simple as that, I'm afraid, because there just doesn't seem to be a particularly good way of connecting it up directly. There's no RGB for the vast majority of units, as you bought in France, as we said. So it's just not going to look that great, I'm afraid. I did buy this thing, a Level Hike HD cable, um, which works on N64, and it's terrible. Just really bad. <laughs> um, the picture is massively over bright, which shows up loads of weird patterning, and yeah, it's just completely useless. So um, that's pretty much your only option. The, the just stick it in a converter you've bought. And obviously, the more expensive your converter box, the better job it will do of it. Because, do you know what this is? That's the complete lack of any sort of mini console version of the Nintendo 64, yep. Nintendo have never made one. They did the NES and they did the Super Nintendo, but they have not done the N64. Possibly because it's a pain in the ass to emulate correctly. That's everyone's best guess anyway. But um, yeah, it's just not a thing. It doesn't exist. Oh well. Play us out, Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue. <laughs>